What was their theme that? song? It's our theme song. Ah, right. missed the memo on that one. Ready? We're gonna yeah. sing it. We're gonna add lyrics to it. I don't know the. Don't it's look just, at me, man. I'm, I'm, I'll leave that to you. Backlot six oh five podcast coming in hot. What the shit? <laughs> Hello everybody and welcome to the Backlot Six O Five Podcast. I am your host. I'm Casey Kelderman. Join with me as always is Mr. Brian Mensing. Brian, what up? What's up? How's it going? I'm doing fine. I can see you this this week. Uh, we've been I, doing it uh, differently. We're going to try out the, this thing called a Zoom. And it seems to be working really well so far. I like it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. I, I think it's going to come to be a big advantage to us here in the future. Not only now, but even after everything gets back to normal. Yes, I agree. This is uh, this is one of the benefits of doing a, a podcast in 2020. I mean, you couldn't do a podcast, I guess, 20 years ago, but uh, it's one of the benefits of doing it uh, that we have to stay home during this crazy pandemic. It's only getting better here in South Dakota, let me tell you. Uh, uh. We don't, <laughs> we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about movies instead. And uh, luckily, through the magic of, of technology, we're able to do that. And uh, this week we're gonna we're gonna have a little bit of normalcy to the show because we're actually gonna have some news to talk about, which is it's nice, it's refreshing to have some news to talk about. New what? Yeah, I mean, no box office yet. Trolls World Tour is out right now on VOD. I guess that will top the box office. So there's your box <laughs> office for. That, will Will that even count? Will they even count it? No, uh, I, I didn't think so. Yeah, we 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 should do an episode on what this means in terms of movies going forward and for the rest of this year because from what i'm hearing uh even if this thing ends you know within the next month or so who knows when things are going to start to open up yet again right uh, and what that will mean for i mean especially in movie theaters where you're tightly packed in the same in the in a, in a small space for for two hours you know can you do that right after this i don't know What's that going to mean for like the Oscars going forward this year? Is is Invisible Man a lock? Is Sonic the Hedgehog going to be nominated for Best Picture? These are questions I want to know. Sonic the Hedgehog for Best Actor. For Sonic? Yes. Uh, best Supporting mm-hmm. Actor, Jim Carrey. I'm actually hey. excited to watch that movie at home. When I'm not paying 20 bucks for it yet, but uh, James gets, Mar- gets James down. Mar- James Marsden has a lock for supporting as well. I've, I've heard he's not the best in the movie, but... <laughs> He oh, look, at it. look at his competition. He unfortunately gets the Neil Patrick Harris, Jason Lee role in the Sonic the Hedgehog live action movie like they did in Smurfs and Al- Alvin and the Chipmunks. Oh. Uh, Next week's episode, Alvin and the Chipmunks and all the squeak wolves. No. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, not a fan? You could actually watch those with your kids, though. I've actually only seen the first two, and I will admit to owning the second one, but that's got Zachary Le- Levi in it. That was my uh-huh. reasoning behind it. You own the squeakle. The squeakle, I do. Yes. And I will then, admit to it. Then there's the, the road chip, right? Yeah? Yes. And uh, what's the, the one on the boat? Oh, don't look at me, man. I don't know. It's, I not, it's some ch- chipmunk pun in there. The road chip, the sinking ship. Uh, Jason Lee's career is dead because of this ship. Um, <laughs> it sounds like a good idea at the time. Yeah, I mean, it probably helped him pay off his house or something. I guess the Kevin Smith movies weren't doing it for him, but this probably did. No, oh, he was probably doing those on the side, too. Oh, well, yeah. They, I mean, if it gave him a reason to to keep doing uh, My Name is Earl, then why not? Chipwrecked. Chipwrecked. Oof. Gotta love the internet. I we will never cover those movies ever on the show ever unless movies disappear except for Alvin and the Chipmunks. <laughs> we have put it down. We have said those words. We can move on from those words. We can move on. Uh, we may cover the animated ones because I like those, but uh, we're never covering the live action ones. Same with Smurfs. <laughs> we will never cover them. Um, the show will end before that ever happens. Anyway, should we move on? Let's move on. Let's do that. Let's get out of this. Uh, let's okay. jump to the news because we actually do have some news this week. And uh, Brian, you're, I know you're excited about both of these pieces of news. I am? Yeah, you are. Okay. 
because they're both horror news. Yay! That's uh, only because you don't look at anything that's not horror news. That's because there's nothing else happening <laughs> right now. Everything's shut down. Uh, we could talk about dark and depressing stuff like Disney laying off a ton of employees. And, but no, we're going to keep it positive. Let's keep it positive here on Let's the Backlot 605 positive. podcast. Uh, first piece of news is Gary Doberman, who has written many of the Conjuring Universe films, uh, and his latest uh, entry was Annabelle Comes Home, which he also directed. Uh, he is set to direct a Salem's Lot remake based on the Stephen King novel, uh, which originally had a TV miniseries, I believe, back in the late 70s when that came out. So, Brian, have you ever seen Salem's Lot? Um, 1979. Bits and pieces. Um, I've read the book. It's one of the few books I can actually say that I've actually read from beginning to end. Um, it's a really good, solid book. Um, but no, I've never actually watched the uh, the original '79 from beginning to end. Yeah, I uh, I have this movie. I watched it. Uh, I watched it about four or five years ago. It was pretty good. It was a little long, of course, as uh, most TV movies go. As I say, um, but yeah, I think it it is it's ripe for a a reboot, a reimagining of this source material. It's directed by Hope, uh, Toby Hooper back in the day. Uh, still has one of my favorite looking vampires uh, in this film. Um, and of mm-hmm. course there is one scene in this movie that, uh, always terrified me. It was the little boy outside the window tapping on it. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a creepy movie. It's still, I think for the most part for a seventies TV movie, it holds up pretty, pretty well. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, having Gary Doberman do this is, a it's a, uh, I don't want to say an inspired choice because he is a horror guy, but it's a, it's a, it's a choice that, uh, just makes sense. It, it's, it's a guy he's set up in the conjuring universe uh knows how that all works um and it'll be nice to see him take on the more supernatural project uh like salem's lot so the conjuring isn't supernatural in the fact that there's you know i mean weird... like ghost uh, and uh, but like taking on like a monster like a vampire this time yeah yeah I mean, they've, I mean they, they've hinted at it a couple times in that series, uh, including a, a werewolf in his Annabelle Comes Home movie. So he's a, he's dabbled in the more fantastical supernatural stuff. Well, and like you said, I mean, he's kind of already in that realm. So it's an, it, it seems like an educated, safe choice and that you've got somebody who's kind of already in that 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 world of the horror genre. So they've worked on it before so they know kind of where they need to be as opposed to having somebody who's never worked in that you know like for instance like you know when kevin smith started kind of getting into the horror realm and whatnot you know that was you you would say if if he would have been hired for something like this you would have been scratching your head going i don't see it this just seems like an educated safe choice because he knows what he's doing at that point yeah, and I think uh, I liked I, I like the work that he's done so far in the in the Conjuring universe. Uh, Annabelle comes home was a nice surprise for me, and yeah, I'm excited to see what he he does and takes on this uh, Stephen King property. I mean, King is King is going to continue to keep growing here. We're going to see a lot more King adaptations, especially after the success of of It three years ago and and its sequel. Not not as a big of a success, but still made its made its money and. I mean, King is always going to be a big name in the in the horror world, whether that be literature or uh, mm-hmm. television or or in film. So I think we're just going to keep seeing these movies pop up, and we'll see more King adaptations here in the next few years. Oh, I think it's even going to get to the point that even well after you know he's passed away, that it's going to be, you know, hey, it's time for a reboot, you know, for the sake of you know. Okay, well, we've done it before. We 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 need more stuff. Stephen King will always have movies, whether it be now or 20, 30 years for, down the road, whether it be an original story or a remake, a reboot, whatever the case is. But we will we will be seeing this for years to come. Yeah, I I think uh, there's a lot of King stuff that hasn't been touched oh, yeah. yet. So I think we'll eventually get to that and in some form, whether that be TV is really kicking off with King stuff or mm-hmm. uh, again with, with the film adaptations, but mm-hmm. next, next piece of news that we got here, 
uh, we got some new Hellraiser reboot news. Um, this coming in after years and years of speculation and announcements of who's directing, who's writing. Um, and this time, I think this one will stick. It just makes it, it makes a lot of sense to me that this one would actually be the one that's bound to happen. Uh, that is director David Bruckner, who, who last did uh, The Ritual from 2017. That is on Netflix. Um, and he is set to direct the new Hellraiser movie. My my concern, my issue with this is that, you know, Hellraiser is one of those ones that, and hopefully they will correct me and prove me wrong, but, you know, that one of those movies that it's, the, the franchise is so far gone that I, I don't see this being a viable resuscitation to that franchise. I think because of how few people have seen the straight to video, straight to DVD, straight to VHS back in the day, <laughs> versions of these movies uh, and the dozens of sequels that it has. Uh, I think Hellraiser is primed for a reboot. Uh, they've been trying for a very long time. Um, and I think you just got to find the right creative team to attach yourself to this. Um, yeah, I mean, those sequels, no one talks about them. No one talks about anything after. They don't talk the about them because they're not good. No, they're not good. And it was just literally the studios making these movies so they can keep the rights saying, well, we'll make the movie now because one day we'll make an actual reboot. One day we'll make an actual reboot. Another franchise that does this is the Children of the Corn uh, series. Oh. They just keep making those because they want to keep the rights because eventually they'll be like, well, this is the actual Children of the Corn reboot, even though we've done 15 sequels to that. But. I think this one might be the one that sticks. Uh, I have a lot of faith in, in giving David Bruckner uh, this film. I, I think uh, he, he, he's, he's a horror guy, first and foremost. And the stuff he's worked on, I've, all, I've liked everything that he's done so far. Uh, he's worked on the, the VHS, the first film. Uh, he did Southbound right after that. And then The Ritual for Netflix. All three, I think, are very underrated movies um and if you look at the vhs and southbound movies those are both um horror anthologies and mm -hmm. he did my favorite segments out of both of those movies so i have faith in this guy and uh a tweet he put out after this news basically it, it helped give me more confidence in this because he basically said don't worry guys we know what we're doing this time pretty much i'm not holding back so that gives me some faith in in, in him and and giving him this, uh, hopefully they'll, they'll give the movie a budget. That's what I'm a little concerned about, is not giving the, the movie the budget that it needs or taking the right steps in terms of either practical effects or mixing the practical effects with special effects. And uh, and that's just it. I mean, your, your practical effects team is going to have to be on top notch and they're going to have to be able to be given the money that they're going to so dearly need to be able to make this not look like absolute garbage. Yeah, and I think you can do that because the first Hellraiser was a pretty low-budget movie, uh, and there's a lot of things you can do with Hellraiser. It's pretty much, there's not a whole lot of settings you got to do with it. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty minimal cast as well. Um, where you have to put your money in is with the special effects, the special gore effects. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and, and again, people, of course, they all, they, they remember Pinhead and the Cenobites, but if you go back and watch that original Hellraiser, they are barely in that movie. They don't need to be in that movie very much. They need to be the 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 big like oomph push right right when the movie needs it. The big Hannibal Lecter, small couple of scenes, the Darth Vader, you know, the the villains that you remember, uh, you you remember, but they're not on the uh, on the screen very much. Well, here's hoping. I'm hoping. I'm 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 excited to to see what he does with it. Uh, David Goyer is still attached to this movie, at least for producing credits. We'll see how that pans out. If you don't know who David Goyer is, um, works on many of the DC, especially the Batman properties over at mm -hmm. DC. Uh, lastly, including Batman versus Superman. Woof. Well, he's, so. he, he has written some good stuff. But and if you look at the stuff he has written, mm -hmm. it's usually with someone else. Like right, he, he, did, exactly. he did write the Nolan trilogy. Mm -hmm, he also exactly. had Chris Nolan and his brother working on the Nolan trilogy. Blade 2, you had him write this. 
he also had Guillermo del Toro directing. So he's worked with, if he works with someone who's good, which I think Bruckner is a very good director, I think it could work out for this movie's benefit. See, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, you look at a Go- you look at Goyer, and yeah, he's got some that are misses and whatnot. But you have to look at the big picture because he's hardly ever the sole writer, and I think he brings a lot to it. I just think that he sometimes gets attached to the wrong projects that just don't fit. Like you know, like you said, he he assisted with the the Nolan trilogy, so he probably got enveloped into the DCEU just like Nolan did for the for Man of Steel, you know. So who knows? Yeah, I think again, I, I I'm not saying he's a bad writer or anything like that. I think I think he's a pretty good big idea guy, but needs someone in, to maybe rein those ideas in and actually mm-hmm. put them put them forward and put them into what can actually be filmed on screen. Right. All right. So yes, those were the two big pieces of news that we got uh, here this this past week. Let us know your thoughts on those. Are you excited for either of those movies? Um, or have you seen the originals of those and what do you think of those? But uh, let's I haven't move. seen a Hellraiser in years. You should rewatch it. It's a, it's a crazy movie. That, that it is. I know it is that. All right. So let's move on to our uh, main topic for this week, Brian. Yes. And that is the 2002 film Equal Librium. And how many people will raise their hands going, I don't even know what this movie is. I've never heard of this movie. Or how many people are saying, wow, I haven't thought of that since 2002. <laughs> I know. It was, it was funny. You and I kind of stepped on this at the, about the same time and whatnot. I was just dinking around on Reddit one day, and somebody put up a post about, about Equilibrium and how underrated and how you know, many people don't even know the movie exists. And when I was like, hey, you know what? I enjoy this movie. I think this might actually be a good one for us to just kind of sit down and just kind of dive into a little bit. Yeah, and I hadn't, so so my history with Equilibrium was uh, I had not heard about this movie until about freshman year of college, and uh, during that time, I was like, American Psycho is the greatest movie ever made, nothing will ever top this, Christian Bale is a god, I cannot believe it. Um, he American is fantastic Psycho. in that movie. American Psycho is still great, and he's fantastic in the movie. Um but yeah, then after that, I'm like, well, I should dig into his, some of his other filmography. And this one popped up. It was on Netflix at that point. It's still on Netflix right now. It's probably it been is. on there since then. Um, but yeah, I had watched this right after I had watched The Matrix for the first time in a college, uh, I believe it was a sociology or psychology class, one of the two. Um, yeah, so I was like, well, I'm kind of in that mood. I'm, I'm in, in the Christian Bale mood. I had just watched The Matrix. This has very much very similar vibes to The Matrix, and we'll talk about that uh, as we discuss the film. But yeah, that was kind of my history with it. And then after that, I'm like, well, my first reactions to it then, and I want to hear yours, your first yeah. reactions before we get to what we actually thought this time around. But I thought it was better than The Matrix back in the day. I loved the action. Um, I thought Christian Bale was great. I liked the world that they set up back then. And uh, yeah, I thought that it was... I, I said it back then. I'm like, well, equal, equilibrium is better than the matrix. What are people talking about? And flash forward to today and we'll, we'll talk about it. So, I mean, like me, I didn't even know the movie even existed until it was already on home video. I actually had a, uh, a friend of mine saying, Hey, you know, I've got this movie. You should totally borrow it and check this out. I'm like, what the hell is this? I've never even heard of it. You know, I recognize both people that the, the two main stars, Christian Bale, Tay Diggs, you know, everybody, you know, you're talking, late 90s early 2000s everybody's talking about how Stella got a groove back so everybody you know Tay Diggs and whatnot um and he's in a couple other good movies that I enjoy like Go uh you know I'm like all right you know I'll give this movie a shot you know and again you're right it's it's post uh American Psycho you know Christian Bale is definitely making the name for himself I'm like I absolutely enjoy this um I, I agree. I agree with you. Like, you know, when I watched this movie for the very first time, the setting that is uh, provided, uh, the, the gun kata, the, just the idea of the premise behind this, you know, it's, it was something different and something original, something I hadn't really seen kind of portrayed that way. Um, you know, and you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's one of those movies that at some point here, you know, I picked up and I, I own the movie and I, you know, just I never got around to rewatching until we decided that we we're going to talk about this. I'm like, well, now is the time. 
Yeah, so yes, we're going to do a deep dive into Equilibrium. Um, we will spoil the movie, so if you have not seen it or hadn't seen it in a while... Then maybe, tough luck, because it's yeah, been 18 years. Tough luck, it's been out for a while. Um, it's on Netflix right now, so if you want to go check that out, come back to this, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, let's let's start with the Christian Bale of it all, because he, okay. is, the, he is the lead of this movie. He uh, is. Equilibrium 2002, directed by Kurt Wimmer. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about the rest of his filmography uh, as we continue through this. Uh, but he, he has said, and I've looked up some, some trivia and stuff on this, and he said Christian Bale was always the guy he wanted for this because he had saw American Psycho, mm-hmm. which watching this movie, there are very similar qualities in terms of yes. what Bale has to do in this movie that are very much in the same vein as this Patrick Bateman character from American Psycho. Yeah, you could definitely see like the 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 emotion aspect of American Psycho in this. Yeah, so so this is written and directed by Kurt Wimmer, uh, and this guy he's not done a whole lot in his career. Uh, this is probably his most notable movie besides his his I, I would say some spiritual follow up I guess. Uh, Ultraviolet will would be yes yeah. yes. Uh, Ultra, Ultra, Ultraviolet was one of those ones that going. I went into Ultraviolet knowing, uh, by this time Equilibrium existed and whatnot, and uh, Ultraviolet's not what I expected it to be. I've never, I've never seen it. No, uh, nor do I have any desire to. But uh, some of the other films he has worked on, um, he has written the Thomas Crown Affair from 1999, which I like that. I like that movie. He is also recent. His most recent stuff. Uh, his last three movies were uh, Salt with with Angelina Jolie, the 2012 remake of Total Recall, which I, I watched it once. I, I I'll just go back and watch the Arnie movie, uh, and then the 20. He was the writer and producer of the 2015 remake of Point Break. <laughs> Ugh. I can't say much to Point Break because I have not seen the. Wait, did I? No, I have not seen the remake. I had to think about that for a second. I thought uh, you were about to say you hadn't seen the original. Oh shoot! I've totally seen the original. Come on, man. That's Keanu and and Swayze. Um, no, I mean some of the stuff that you like you you brought up and whatnot. You know, there there's films in there I I do certainly enjoy. It's just that sometimes you know, there's just not quite what you want them to be, I guess. Yeah, I think again we talked about it with David Goyer. He's a big guy. He's a big idea guy. This guy, he is this David Wimmer. Uh, maybe not in the execution part, but I think mm-hmm. he has some big ideas. I'll give the guy that he's always swinging for the fences with what he's doing. So. Oh yeah, he definitely swings for the fences. We'll give him that. So should we jump into a equal Libra? Yes, let's get back to Christian Bale. All right, so Bale, Bale. stars. Yes. John Preston. Yeah. So he is basically um, one of the leading, I don't even know what, what, what were they called? They were called. They're the clerics. Clerics. They, but they were like the next step above like the future. So this movie set in the future. Let's set, set up where this movie set up first. Set yeah. up in, I believe, 2079 was the future. Yeah, it was like uh, like an alternate future post for you know when they make reference to World War Two and the idea of war and what had happened and where they decided that society needed to go. This is post World War Three, Brian. World oh, War sorry, Three has right, happened, right? Uh, and basically, they have figured out. Basically, I think it would assume America lost this one, <laughs> and whatever foreign government won. Uh, and basically created this totalitarian government where you have to take this serum and you feel nothing, you feel no emotions because they believe, and, and maybe rightfully so, I guess, uh, that I, emotions I, create war and famine and chaos and everything bad in the world, which, I mean, you're not wrong. The, that, that is one of those underlying parts to the story that, there is some legitimacy to it. Like I get where the, the through line is, but at the same time see, too, it's, can, it's, it's that it's not feasible. Yeah. You can see why the government and much like maybe the purge movie can mm-hmm. kind of give an idea. You can maybe see why a purge would happen for movie logic. Same with equilibrium here. You could see right. why in movie logic, this is where the world has come to. Um, it's a more believable future than demolition man. 
but yeah, so so Christian Bale, John Preston, he's a cleric. Basically, he's the next step above uh, local law enforcement. He's sent in to to stop people who uh, have uh, stopped taking their what was that called? Prosium is what the, Some, the drug something is like called. that. Yeah, and yeah. he's like the like the highest ranking official in this you know elite. Basically, he's the, he's the biggest badass in this universe. That's that's pretty yeah. much what it is. That's all and, it is. And you know what? That's okay. It's Christian yeah. Bale. He he's allowed to be the badass. He very much like the the Matrix. Uh, he is the one. He's the chosen one in this in this scenario. Uh, and even so much so, I'm not saying Kurt Wormer, you know, ripped off the Matrix or anything like that. But even down to the way Christian Bale looks in this movie, he looks like Keanu in the Matrix. Well, you mean like the long dark trench coat and the simplicity, the, the gunfighting, the flips, the slow motion, even the hairstyle. <laughs> well, the the the, the gunfighting and stuff like that—that's something. The uh, gun, you know, sometimes gun kata, gun fu, gun whatnot. Fu. That's something that is that predates the Matrix and Equilibrium, and whatnot. Both of those movies have definitely taken their their strides from that. So yeah, the Matrix is this. So two thousand two, when this movie came out, that movie was still <clears throat> everywhere. The, everything was ripping off the Matrix at that point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I I don't want to say this guy was ripping it off, but maybe he saw that and was like, I can. I have this idea I was working with. Maybe we combine it with the action of the Matrix. Because I definitely think there is a lot of parallels between the two and a lot of oh, there's crossover. definitely there's definitely parallels because you figure by O two we're already getting into like the Matrix Reloaded, Matrix Revolution time frame. So mm -hmm. you know it's still right there in that same timeline. Okay, so the the first thing we're really set up with is yes, this is post World War three. We get that opening narration, um, and basically we're kind of thrown right into the action here with Christian Bale taking on. Uh, this this group of, of resistance people um, that live, the they they live in the other uh, in the other, in the underground and they are trying to basically take over the the main leader of this this world the father as he's called in the movie trying to overthrow him yeah and they're trying to yeah they they, they don't want to live in a emotionalist world which I understand as well uh, and so they're basically trying to take it over and Bale's job little job is to stop these people um that are literally br they're breaking the law by not taking this this serum that makes them feel no emotion and hoarding and collecting things that cause emotion <laughs> including the mona lisa it's authentic let's burn it so uh i, I wrote down some notes as i was watching this so okay uh, there's the opening gunfight with christian bale he's a badass of course mm -hmm. um you learn of of the serum that, that creates no emotion, and yes, uh, the I think a lot of the action in this movie is a lot of trailer fodder, where they're like, "This would look badass in a trailer." <laughs> How I feel a lot of the action is because it's not it's not well shot. It's not because the the thing I'm going to compare it to now, and I think we're maybe a little spoiled with our action movies now is, is the Matrix. Even the Matrix has has better action scenes than this um but like john wick if you mm -hmm. look like everything's in frame in john wick the editing is built around the fighting not uh not the fighting built around the editing where you have to cut every 0.2 seconds to make it look like christian bale's a badass <laughs> which i don't like i'm like I just show it christian bale would learn he would uh there's there's one fight we'll talk about later that i like in this movie but what did you think of this opening fight here where they eventually find and torch the, the Mona Lisa? Uh, I mean, it, it's fine. I mean, you, you reference in terms of like the, the gunfighting and stuff like that. And, you know, my, you know, I, the, I always think of the, the first one where it's in, in complete darkness, you know, that mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's, it, seems like it's cut simplicity you know in a very simplistic way but i think that's also for the sake of showing that they've somehow managed to learn and adapt to know how to be able to basically dodge bullets without having to worry about bullet time and to be the matrix to you know that it was a more of a knowing your enemy more than it is manipulating space and time so i think that's where they kind of like 
maybe separate the two. Um, I mean, they, I don't know. I, I, I find more excitement in the way that those things are shot because they are, you know, everything is where he's literally just in one single spot you know, they're all trying to shoot at him, which there's the whole logic behind that, how it's like, don't shoot each other. Yeah, and how um, they, I don't know how they miss. They're not, they're not very far away from Christian Bale when they're shooting at him. Yeah, but he keeps hitting them. And he's, they're, they're all over the, no, I don't know. The part I, I don't like about this version of Gun, Gun Fu uh, is the Bale shooting. He's shooting two arms out, and then he'll cross them. I'm like, you're wasting so much time doing that by shooting in the same spot. Just keep your arms out. And it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me to, to cross your arms. Just cause, But, again, he, I think he's it, trying, it he's looks tr- cool. It looks really cool, and he's trying to confuse the enemy. Where's the gun going? <laughs> that's what it, and that's probably why 18-year-old Casey loved this movie is because it looked effing cool. Like, it was it the coolest amazing. thing ever. It was awesome. And it's kind of a, I don't want to say this is kind of a dude bro matrix, but it's kind of a dude bro matrix. Maybe a little bit. Like, look at that. He crossed his guns. Yeah. But let's, let's go into, so we get into the actual story. They burn the Mona Lisa. Basically, it says anything with, like, anything artsy related or, or television music, anything like that is gone. It's uh, extinct from this world. Anyone who let's violates burn that burn all be, the books. Anyone who violates that will be shot dead by, right. by John Preston. Uh, so then we, we learn about his wife, who was a, what are they, the, it's a sense, censor, sense offender? Yes, sense, yeah, offender. sense offender. Uh, so basically, she she broke the rules. She did not take her serum, uh, and this has left him as a single father. A single a, father of two. Yep, a son and a daughter. His son is very much going into the same uh, line of duty as his dad is, and acts yep. very much like like Bale does. And um, yeah, he notices that uh, his partner at this time, played by Sean Bean, always love Sean Bean. Sean Bean's amazing. He's the best. He should have been in this movie more, and we'll we'll talk about why he's not because he dies again. And you know the the, the best part of though is is that you know even if he is literally in like the first what maybe fifteen minutes of the yeah, film, about maybe minutes. Um, he puts on a very fantastic performance. Um, very cool, straight, um, just delivers it magnificently. Yeah, I think he's he's really good in this movie again. Uh, this is post um, Bond for him, post uh, uh, Goldeneye. Oh, so yes. Probably typecast as the villain at this point. We are getting, he, this was, I mean, this was, I guess, post um, Return of the King, or not Return of the King, um, Fellowship of the Ring. So I guess he, he, was, he was kind of breaking away from being the bad guy that dies, but he's still very much Sean Bean. I die in every movie I'm in. <laughs> What? No. Yeah, so basically, um, Bale's character, John Preston, finds out that uh, his partner, played by Sean Bean, has taken a book at this point, which breaks the law, um, and Preston shoots him dead right there in a, I believe they were in a church? Yes, Something but like in their nether re- lands or whatever it is, yeah. that's basically the equivalent of the, the place of where all the uh, underground and all of the basically where the the people with no money would go you know the people who are definitely the, the lower class um and you can definitely tell that he, there is that scene when he figures it out that he can tell that you know his partner is not taking his serum he can tell that he's like oh you know and he just basically he does his due diligence to confirm it before he just assumes anything you know, going down to the evidence to check to see if the book was actually turned in as he said he was going to be, you know, that sort of thing, you know, because he's still going through that that realm of, uh, well, just because I think this doesn't necessarily mean so I'm going to I'm going to do what I'm supposed to to ensure that my partner isn't you know off the rails. Yeah. And then right after this, pretty much, I mean, it was within the next scene or two, uh, Bale, for the first time, we are to assume uh, he doesn't take his his prosium serum at this point. Yep, that's for when he he accidentally uh, drops his vial, destroys it, doesn't have anything to do its thing, and he never gets around to uh, taking uh, it again. 
taking it again, or at least in, in, in enough time for the emotion to start kicking in mm -hmm. to, to make him hesitate to keep taking it. And this is where, this is where we're introduced to his son, which uh, he's a little, little jerk. He does. He does kind of remind me of like the kid from the Omen, just because <laughs> you know, like he just shows up and you just want to be like, "Oh my God, what are you doing, kid?" He's just Don't a creepy. Me. He's a creepy kid. He's yeah, a creepy he, kid. He does. He does a great job of being the creepy kid. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, you 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 make reference to the fact that you know, uh, Preston goes and he realizes what his his partner's doing. He tracks down his partner, executes him as per orders because he's disobeying the law and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And the next day is when this happens with that that vial, and you think, what would it, what would what would this movie be like if it was if the day before when he dropped it? Yes. Yeah. We Sean Bean would have survived. Sean Bean would have lived. Tay Diggs would not be in this movie. <laughs> so let's get since you brought him up, Brian. Let's get into Tay Diggs because okay. this is where he's introduced. He is the new partner of John Preston. Yes. I got problems with his character. What's your problems with this character? And maybe not just his character, but the way Tay Diggs presents him. He is so showing so much emotion in this movie for a guy who has no emotions. I hate it to make it took me so far out of this movie. That was the one thing I did notice, just in the theme overall um, of of this here. Not even just Tay Diggs, and Tay Diggs just definitely shows it because I think he's the worst offender of it. Because I mean, if you really delve down to what is emotion, greed is an emotion. He was being greedy about his transcending into the ranks and to basically be better than Bale's character, and he absolutely was showing you know fits of anger and greed and envy smiles a lot too yes and like you know they make reference in regards to the who plays the father and why you know they are the way they are because of of that situation but it's like yeah you you kind of start to tay Diggs kind of makes you realize that once that happens or whatever you're like oh now if you go back and you actually even think of just bale's character or anybody for that matter you know it's like they're only excluding certain emotions, like not all emotion, just because, I mean, otherwise they would be literally like walking zombies. And I think that's what they were trying to portray. And Bale does a better job of that than Tay Diggs. Um, and I, I mean, I think for the most part, everybody else in this movie is pretty straight laced in what they're doing. I mean, they're all pretty much pretty, pretty stoic, not, not giving a whole lot of emotion in, in their voices or anything like that. But then uh, just when Tay Diggs shows up, he's all like, Hey man, I'm your new partner. And like, I'm all smiley and man, I, I really want to learn from you. And, and I want to be you. And like, dude, like you're showing too much emotion. I would have had red flags pop up right away with this guy. Right. Why wasn't that guy already quarantined already? <laughs> yeah. Why wasn't he shot dead already? <laughs> So, yeah, besides that, and we'll talk about that more with the, the twist of this movie. The twist! Um, um, you, know, you know, and I'll, 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 I'll say, it, though, is, is that I enjoy Tay Diggs in this movie, but if you look at the concept of what the movie is supposed to be, you're absolutely right. It, he, it, it's not fitting, like, to the point where maybe he wasn't the best one to cast, but... Again, this is your early 2000s. He's kind of on this little bit of a stride. So I'm not surprised. They're like, okay, well, we need this younger African-American to kind of portray this character. We have an idea who we want to be. Let's put Tay Diggs in it. Yeah, and Marlon Wayans was still doing comedy, so they couldn't get him. Uh, exactly. I mean, Ooh. this isn't this isn't my favorite Tay Diggs performance. That goes to maybe Malibu's Most Wanted. Um, Go. <laughs> I like him in Malibu's Most Wanted. He's fun. Uh, but here, he, yeah, just his acting just doesn't fit what they're trying to do here. Right. Uh, so what, what was next here? Basically, they, is it another action scene that we get to? Yeah, uh, it's, it's the, uh, so he gets his new partner, uh, played by Tay Diggs. Uh, this is where we get to the action scene where he has not taken the serum for the first time. So he's starting to feel emotion for the first time while killing or sent on a raid to kill these people. Oh, um, that's when they go on that chase for all the 
the resistance. Yes, and this is the yeah the first time he doesn't. Uh, some guy is shot, and he falls into Bale's arms, and Bale finally like sees a, mi- a man dying in his arms for the first time in his life, and feels what that actually is is like. Uh, so we get to see his first first bits of emotion. Um, after that, he he finds that music room with all that. The uh, there's a record player and a bunch of music paraphernalia on the walls. Uh, and he right. plays plays this this classic song on on this record player, and Bale gives Bale is giving it his all in this movie. I'll give him that. He's he's really good in this movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, I definitely would have to agree with that. Yeah, and he starts he starts crying over the music. I mean, I think that's a that's a good scene in this movie. I like that scene a lot. Oh yeah, I mean. And the the snow the snow globe and all of the mm-hmm. that respect of it oh yeah definitely you know it's it's amazing I I one thing I enjoy about this there's those little subtle nuances and whatnot that Bale definitely shows without actually having to give words that provides the emotion that or they're basically trying to emphasize in this film yeah he's a good actor did you know that yeah I, he's pretty yeah. good uh, so this is where we get to. The scene I did I did not like very much, and is that uh, this is when uh, they find the puppies. Oh yes, not the puppies. Yeah, so they find <laughs> the puppies. Another thing that is not allowed, I guess, because puppies make you feel emotion, which they do. Um, right, but and still, it's like. So does that mean that there's no animals? Animal yeah. Whatsoever. Like where where do we where do they stop with that? I'm like. I guess I can't have a pet gerbil. I can't have a hamster because it just causes happiness. It does. You'd get none of it. And so they, they line them up and shoot them down, these puppies. Uh, except oh. one that escapes, this cute little puppy. Again, reminding me a little of John Wick. And uh, <laughs> So this one puppy comes up. Bale picks, picks up the puppy. He begins licking his face. And, of course, your heart melts for this. And, uh, yes. Yeah, they're basically they tell him to either shoot him and shoot the the puppy himself or give it to them and they'll take care of it and he takes it back saying it should be examined for diseases or he makes up an excuse basically to say no, I I'm keeping this one because I'm actually feeling emotions for the first time in my life. And you know the part that's kind of funny about that is that that's just, you know, the part is he is doing what you would actually think would be a smart maneuver for these people. If if animals or pets or dogs or whatever are not so, are against the law and they're being bred or raised ill lawful, you know, against the law, wouldn't you think you would have those taken to be tested for the sake of rabies or who knows it, how many you know with as many years in the future as it is, is there any sort of disease or something like that that they need to be able to make sure that they're uh, addressing? So you know, not just you know hose them down bullets and just leaves them there yeah i i'm like you could have you know train the dogs to help you out and 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 kill all the you know the the resistance people i mean dogs are useful i mean it's not not anything uncommon in the police force to use dogs i mean exactly how are you supposed to go on drug raids without like just a drop in logic right there just had to kill a puppy to to put some emotional oomph in this scene yeah yeah well how else are you gonna you can't get it out of a cat. You got to yeah, use a puppy. We didn't get it out of Sean Bean, so you got to use a puppy. If the bean didn't work, the puppy will. Exactly. Uh, so going forward, this is when he begins to stop taking his his prosium uh, serum and going forward on purpose this time because he's beginning to to feel emotions again. He's beginning to feel for his wife, for his ex partner. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, from this point forward, he, he removes the mirror from his bathroom and hides them all behind there. That is one one thing I just really remember from the first time watching it is him hiding it behind the mirror. Yep. Um, so then next scene pretty much we got um, is they, they arrest uh, the, the character of Mary O'Brien, played by Emily Watson. So she's not given a whole lot to do in this movie, unfortunately. No, I, she she doesn't do a lot, but I do say that the, the, the scenes that she's in, she definitely holds her own against Christian Bale. Yeah, she's good in the movie. I just, uh, again, I think if this movie was made in 2020, she would have 
she would have a much meatier role in this movie. She would be a lot bigger in the, in the film. Oh, come on. She would have been on car chases and stuff like that. You know, if it was, you know, if, if this would have been Michael Bay directing this film, then it would, she, then she would have gone all Marissa Torme or, you know, whatever. And, uh, not Marissa Torme, excuse me, Tia Leon, um, going on the, the, the chases and all this stuff like, like in bad boys. And we would have got gratuitous ass shots of Emily Watson in this movie too, if it was directed <laughs> by Michael Bay. Right. But basically through, through his uh, interrogation of, of, of O'Brien basically finds out about more of the underground people and um, basically what Sean Bean was doing with them. And he, this leads to him um, infiltrating their, their underground area. Right. Right. Or am I, I'm jumping a little too far ahead. No, that's, that's about where we're at. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's going to go and infiltrate the underground thing. Uh, but in doing so, he again is starting to feel more feelings for his wife. Um, he takes her evidence box and starts smelling a piece of her clothing, which was a little creepy. Uh, hey, you know what? You he know, missed her. He did miss her. I, I get it. I get it. Uh, but he kept it in his pocket as a little souvenir of my dead wife. But uh, it, this, it was just a ribbon. It, oh, just a, it was a ribbon. It, it's not like it was undergarments or something. No, that would, that would have been <laughs> funny though. In a Michael Bay movie, it would have been a thong, right? Um, so this, this is uh, before we get to him going underground. This is where we get the the scene of the puppy in the trunk of the car. Yes, so, yes. Right now, he is about to uh dig further into some of the underground stuff and before that some of the feds surround his car uh as he has the puppy in the back and uh you you think he's gonna get away with it first first off because they they finally realize who he is and they're like whoa wow it's the biggest badass in the world we gotta back off man we got a badass over here and (laughs) then uh we get a a part that made me laugh out loud because i thought it was ridiculous but awesome at the same time it is when the two police officers have their shotguns pointed at him and he just literally slaps the gun so they spin around and catches them midair and then shoots them away oh my i love the action in this movie you have to admit that that was a beautiful shot even i agree like i'm i'm rewatching and i was like oh that oh yeah point blank rage right to the face yes I, it was, I, I literally laughed out loud at it. It is over the top, but it is, it's a ton of fun. Mm-hmm. I like, I, I do, the action is not realistic in the slightest, um, but I think it's, it's, it's fun. It's a fun new way to shoot action, especially, right. I think uh, the, a lot of the crap I give to the action is from the first action scene in this movie because it's so damn poorly lit. It's all in the dark. Um, yeah. But here it gets a little better. Bale's doing some, he's doing a flip here, uh, which is cool. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, he bitch slaps the guns out of their hands, shoots them away, kills everybody there. Um, it's basically left unknown who, who did this uh, going forward with him and his, his government. They're trying to figure out who did that. Um, yeah, and then this is where we get to uh, the raid on the warehouse right after this so this is where um we have another another fight scene after this and where i i I for some reason thought tay diggs was in on the underground people but he wasn't but uh, this is the part where they have the the line of offenders set up and bale refuses to shoot them pretty much Mm -hmm. and leads to the first a, a big red flag for for tay diggs oh yeah when he hesitates to do the shooting himself yeah and then but, uh and then shortly thereafter when we get the nice little fight sequence there too between those two so yeah that was right after this i like the fight scene between those two i think it's probably mm-hmm. the best out of out of this movie yes and again tay diggs is showing a lot of a lot of emotion there which i don't like makes me wonder if he's taking his that's what i that's I thought the movie was setting that up. I guess not uh, <laughs> we'll see that in the third act but uh yeah they have a, a fun little fight between the two in their practice area and mm-hmm. kind of shows that so at that point you're kind of wondering if if you know is is, is tay diggs character like uh is he in on this too because he he's pretty well sure that it's bail being the one 
uh, that killed the, the, the feds and isn't taking his serum. So he's pretty sure of bail, but we're kind of unsure of Tay Diggs at this point. Right, right. Um, the one thing I will say about this whole like warehouse part of the film and whatnot is the fact that you have the fight sequence with, with bail where he literally takes everybody out with a pair of pistols and not even shooting them, but with the butts of the gun. Cause badass. Yeah. He's got some sort of little switch, whatever it gets little basically like spikes at the end. And you just like, you watch him like whipping it around all of a sudden just basically implodes their face mask and just, you know, punctures their face with the butt of the gun. Like, hey, well, you know, they, they had to do something a little bit new, a little bit different. They can't just keep shooting them the same way. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing uh, as we continue uh, with this, this, this movie um, that I noticed is that there is not a whole lot of, of gratuitous violence in this movie. No. Where a lot of the stuff is either bloodless or takes place off screen, but this movie is R-rated. Uh, and I, I was looking up some trivia on the action here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the things was, yes, the violence starts with very little bloodshed. And then towards the end, we actually do get bloodshed at the end. It's not very much, but there is. And they wanted to do that to make you feel emotion, just like the character is. And I'm like, yeah, that, that didn't really work, but I see what I, 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 I see, I see the, I see the line. Yeah. It didn't work, but I see the line. <laughs> Like, again, I'm like, just make it a gratuitous bloody action movie, then. Just do it. Yeah. Can't, can't make the law look like they're completely in control. He's literally blowing people's faces off. Just <laughs> show it. <laughs> uh, so, so next up, we get to where he finally does infiltrate the underground. Um, and we get introduced to a character I forgot was in this movie, William Fickner. Oh, I freaking love him. He's great. He's great in everything uh yeah he shows up he's basically the the leader the one of the 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 leader of the underground the leader of the underground of emotion um so he is yeah he's basically leading this resistance he's the uh um oh my god what's his name from from demolition man um dennis leary he's the dennis leary he's i was like he's not in demolition man i was literally I know he's not. I was literally just about to go to IMDb to 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 prove you wrong, and I'm like, oh, I see what you're going there. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. he's the Den- he's the Dennis Leary of the he's, Demolition he's the, Man. In this he's movie. the he's the smiley. Yes, he is. I mean, every post apocalyptic movie that takes place in a utopia has has the underground, the people living living literally under the city, uh, and are trying to rise up and take over. So this time, led by William Fickner, I like I like him. He's he's not given a whole lot to do in this movie. He only gets a couple scenes, but right. I like seeing him pop up. Oh, I love, I love watching him pop up. Like he's, he's one of the highlights at the beginning of the dark night um, in the bank scene. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I just, I do, I appreciate where the fact that, you know, he is one of those ones where he's not the cash grab. He's not the guy that people are going to go to the movies to go see, but he's always solid in what he does. And, and even if he shares a, one scene two scenes with somebody and whatnot he always kills it all right so then we we go forward and this is where the the higher ups uh begin to realize that uh there is a traitor in the ranks of the the clerics they don't know who it is at this point um and they basically want want someone to go undercover and infiltrate uh the underground and figure out who the traitor is and so this then leads to to uh the death of of emily watson's character again Mm -hmm. not not given a lot to do it's kind of a very an emotionless scene besides bale acting his ass off right i mean yeah and and again that's the thing where it's like if this movie would be made now she'd make it all the way to the end yeah or she'd be this one of the survivors or this would have actually had some emotion behind it I mean, Bale. I think Bale is doing pretty good here. Um, he's giving it his all, but I, I, I don't. I don't know about you. I didn't feel anything. I didn't know her. Right. So I he wish did. That, yeah, he sort of. I mean, he had a couple conversations with her. I, it reminded. <laughs> it reminded mostly. I think it was. It remind. She reminded him of his wife. Yes. Yes. Which is what it is. There's not a whole lot to it. They only share a couple scenes together. They look kind of alike. Yeah. 
So basically, he tries to stop it. She gets uh, executed, um, and then then going forward, this is kind of, that's kind of the, the straw that breaks the camel's back for him. This is where he's going. I'm taking down the system, man. He is going to take down the system, one bloody bullet at a time, sort of boy. <laughs> So, uh, and then after this happens, this is when Tay Diggs catches him uh, and, and tries to reveal him as the traitor. Again, Tay Diggs showing a lot of emotion when this happens. Oh, you see just the, the amount of envy in that particular scene. Yeah, so basically what happens in this scene, this is the first twist that we get to sort of in, this, in the movie. So basically Tay Diggs brings him before the, 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 the council of leaders or whatever the leader is, um, boring, bland, white, bad guy um and he he presents bale as the 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 traitor he's the infiltrator of this this the underground and i found him and bale gives you know a convincing thing well no this is what i was doing and you're actually the traitor and plays everything off that uh tay diggs is and then he overreacts which i'm like dude you just proved that bale is right at this point you are probably the infiltrator because you are right. yelling and screaming like a little child <laughs> <laughs> well I agreed and yeah and if he's supposed to be that one who's supposed to be taking his meds then he should be calm cool and collected mm -hmm. and trying to just basically state his case yeah and bale is call, calm cool and collected during this mm -hmm. and tay diggs is freaking out i'm like it's just a little lapse in logic i didn't like in this movie yeah uh then next we get to this is where um his son figures out that he is not taking his serum anymore, which is, uh, I think it's a good scene. It's, uh, it's also revealed that the, the son and the daughter have not been taking their serums and have kind of been playing it off coy since the, that their since their mother passed away. Right. Which at this point has been four years and these kids are just super young. So They're talk good about actors. good actors and very smart. Mm-hmm. So, I, again, I think we could have used a little more with, with Bale and his kids. Oh, yeah. Because we kind of only get the what, you, you, two you, scenes. Well, you, and you barely even get that for the daughter. Like, she's literally on screen for yeah, she's maybe the, 60 seconds total. She's at the table when, the, when we're first introduced to the, the family. Right. And I don't think she says a line of dialogue. So No, and you see her at the very end, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, this is basically sets up that that's he's he Bale is finally realizing that hey, this isn't this isn't the way to live life. My kids know it. If the kids know it, why 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 don't I know it? So this is when he sets up a meeting with the um, the father, the leader of of the evil Nazi organization, <laughs> um, the leader of the free world of of Libra. Libra. That's what it's called. Uh, so basically, a couple things line up here. Uh, the underground is basically said the only way to end this, you have to kill the father. I think his kids saying, Dad, this isn't the way to live is kind of what finally pushes him over the edge. Mm -hmm. And Bale comes in like an angel from heaven, all in white, looking like a badass. With a machete. With a... No, he's with a, Not, with a katana. A katana blade, excuse me. Yeah. We were he's talking about machete good. earlier. Again, uh, it's a kind of a cheesy futuristic look. I dig it. It's fun. Yeah, and you get going back to the the director and whatnot. You definitely see this look merge into ultraviolet. Like it's like he he's like he's filming these scenes, and going, "I have an idea. I'm gonna keep using this. It's gonna yep. be badass." Yep, exactly. That's how I feel like he talks. Kurt Warmer. <laughs> Guys, it's gonna be badass. We're gonna have Christian Bale. My next anyway, movie so, had Mamila Jovovich. Yeah, I mean he got the action stars. Uh, I mean Bale was was on the up and up and mm -hmm. Mila Jovovich was just what, starting with uh, whatever franchise she does. I don't even The remember. Resident Evil. Resident Evil. She would at least been at least one movie in, possibly two. Yeah. So here we are, third act, final final confrontation between Bale and the father. Um, this is where we get our second twist. They've known all along that Bale is the infiltrator. Yes. Sure they did. Said, Here's Tay Diggs, not in jail. Yeah, not in jail, smiling. I got you. Oh, wait, I'm showing more emotion. Yeah. Basically, again, showing emotion by saying, hey, I got you, and also, I'm, I was envious of you, so therefore, I'm taking your spot now. Right. 
And then and it, here we basically all that happens next is we get a, another pretty fun fight between Bale and everybody in this. Well, before we get that, though, we get the twist that the father actually isn't the father. And it's actually been his boss the whole time. Again, what a twist. What have I? Yeah, yes. again, uh, I made a note. The, the, the father reminded me of, of, of Zordon from Power Rangers because he's a, <laughs> kind of a floating head most of the time. Right. Yeah, you realize that he's, or even better yet, uh, the Wizard of Oz, you know, in that he's literally the, the guy who he's been meeting with this whole time. That's why he's been able to, to know what's been going on because he's not who he says he is. And all of a sudden they dissolve the screen and magically here's his boss, not the guy who he thought he was supposed to be meeting, you know, yeah. what a, what a twist. Yeah. I, 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 luster. I'm like, you could have just been, could have just made him the big bad guy, the emperor type of character and had his boss be the Darth Vader. It just, it right. doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, after this, everybody was gun foo fighting and going forward. Uh, t- he, 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 yes. Uh, but at this point right now, we don't, we, it's no longer, gun foo fighting now we're actually playing with swords and whatnot we do we get some sword play in this uh he he takes on tay Diggs again this time uh this is where the the violence starts to ratchet up a little bit which i wish wish the the whole movie had mm-hmm. uh literally slices tay Diggs career up at this point um slices his his, his face I, off. Lo- I i legit love that part because you just watch him he just seemed fall to his knees Mm-hmm. Just the, the the panicked look on his face of the of the boss, and then just all of a sudden, Tay Diggs just turns his head and just face falls off. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I wish there was more of it. I, I feel like this action scene at the end is very short. Yes, I, I, I should have kept time on it because it's not very long. It's not. I didn't feel. I don't know about you, and we'll get to it when we get to the end of this movie. I didn't feel gratified with this final fight. Yeah, I can see that. Like there there should have been more more maybe fighting with him and Tay Diggs and whatnot. They have a very they seem to have a very good chemistry in terms of the fight sequence. Um I mean I would have liked if if the the twist here at the end where they know that Bale is the infiltrator, I wish that would have happened at the end of the second act. That kind of makes sense story wise to me that that would be the end of the second act where like you're the infiltrator and they beat the snot out of him and, and leave him for leave him for dead or he escapes to the underground one or the other and then here he rises out uh, all white and has to fight his way raid style from the bottom floor up to the father B. so yeah this is basically <laughs> then again we get uh here we get the gun foo fighting uh between him and the his his boss right which is a lot of i wrote down this guy likes john woo movies <laughs> Uh, because it's a lot of that. Um, it, again, doesn't last very long. Of course, Bale wins. Of course. And the movie, I, so basically what happens at the end uh, is he, he stops the father and it's broadcast everywhere um, and shown that the father is no longer living, I guess. And then basically saying that this is the revolution and end of the movie. And then all of a sudden, there's just the uprising, and all the all the police are being shot and killed. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> so yeah, that's the end of the movie. Um, I feel I, I, maybe my tone of voice is very lackluster because I didn't. There's not a whole lot to the end of the movie, really. You feel disappointed now. Yeah. So, should we get into our our thoughts on this movie then? Sure. Um. I'll start because I think you'll be more positive than me. (laughs) I'm just a positive person. Yeah. I want to end on a positive note because, okay. uh, Yeah. I, this movie did not hold up for me. Um, I wanted it to, I had very fond memories of when I watched it again, the biggest positive I have for this movie, Christian Bale is really good in this movie. He's giving it his all. He's fantastic. He's really trying. He's giving the source material, everything it, it needs. I think he easily is the best parts. And if, they were to rework this this movie or what have you it's not because of him because because of what he gave to this movie right um where i have problems with is a lot of the the story and direction mm-hmm. um much like the people in like like the the world that they live in i felt no emotion which is not good for a movie uh the whole point of a movie and this movie kind of makes a point of it especially with burning of like the art stuff and music and the Mona Lisa like 
that art gives you emotion. Movies are art, and this movie gave me no emotion. So therefore, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by saying how bad it is to have no emotion while looking at art while giving a movie that has no emotion while I'm looking at art. But uh, yeah, again, right. we, we talked about it. Tay Diggs is very, I think he's miscast in this movie um, or not given the right direction for his character. Um, I think there's a lot of promise for this story going forward and we can talk about that. I want, I want to talk about what we could do, what we could do. You and I, we're going to remake this, Brian, let's do it. F it. Uh, <laughs> but I think there's a lot they can work with, with the equilibrium storyline. But, uh, what was your thoughts on, on this time watching it? Well, I, I, I definitely left watching this film and it may be in a different position than I did the first time. You're absolutely correct. It's amazing what how many years can really change a perspective on a film. Um, I, again, I agree. I think Christian Bale crushes it. Um, I think if maybe if the definition of what the serum and what they're supposed to feel and not feel is supposed to do, I think would give for better. It's it's in that writing aspect of it, like what you said. Um, that would maybe give Tay Diggs a little bit better of a feel for his character because if it's only supposed to be for the sake of certain emotions or things that would cause war and famine and stuff like that, then it would make a little bit more sense because you see, you definitely see emotion out of Tay Diggs. Like I said, the greed, the a envy, lot. a lot of basically the seven deadly sins type of thing. Like the, those core core emotions and the fact that no one brings it up in the movie takes you out of it as an audience member we're like right your whole premise is no one showing showing emotion and this guy's showing a ton of it right exactly so i i think that's i i don't want to i i want to say for what tay Diggs put into the movie based on what he was written and given and like you said maybe not necessarily the right direction to say hey you know, you're doing great, but we need to tone it down a little bit to show that he doesn't have that. But if you're not given that right direction, you know, and the, the director's like, yep, that's exactly what I was looking for. Well, it com- defeatly, defeats the premise of the film. Yeah. As long as my action looks badass. Badass. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so, I mean, yeah. overall, overall, I still enjoy the movie. It's, it's, it's a good popcorn movie for the sake of, you know, just... For, for the sake of fun, for the sake of the fights, where, you know, it's nothing that's going to scream any sort of awards or anything like that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a good, fun, different type of film. You don't get to see stuff like this much anymore. So it's just kind of fun just to be able to sit back and rewatch it kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it doesn't quite hit everything like I remember it, but I still enjoy it. Yeah, uh, so going forward, I think – Equilibrium is prime for a, a remake or a reboot or taking this story and reworking it. I would agree. I would, I would definitely agree. Some of the ideas they're working with, I can, I, I can definitely see working in a film. Mm-hmm. And there's just certain things I think if you would have tightened them up and focused on them a little more, like, like, like I, I think the best scene in the movie is probably Bale listening to the music right for the oh, first the, time with, with uh, the the vinyl record yeah yeah i think it's the it's probably the best scene in the movie if we have more stuff like that and more focused on on him as a character and then going forward with his relationships because we i mean we don't focus a whole lot on he they focus on too many relationships i think with him like right with a partner with a wife with his kids but we don't get enough of any of them to feel a full semblance of of this guy this character so and with a with a puppy too. I mean, we get a, a lot of things for him to work. He with. needs the puppy. But I'm like, just then maybe just focus on the puppy. You know, like John Wick, just focus on the puppy, or the wife. You know, you can't do the puppy anymore now though because of John Wick. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm. I think if he did this now and just said him focusing on his kids, I think that would be a, a, a unique thing to focus on because not a lot of action movies focus on a single dad and his kids. I think that would be right. very interesting. Yeah. Um, and with the action, I mean, you're looking at how action is shot today with like the raid movies or John wick or even Mad Max where everything's in frame and you actually see what's happening. I think if you did this, you can still work with the gun, the gun foo, the gun kata, whatever you want to do, but do it in frame where it's a little less wonky in the editing. Could be. 
Yeah. So I think there's a lot to, there's a lot you can work with. It'd be, uh, I would be all for trying to give equilibrium another shot. I think, I think it would be a good one. And I think it's, I think it's stayed uh, enough time out of the spotlight that I think it's definitely doable. I don't think it was ever in the spotlight. We're talking about it. We're talking, yeah, we're talking about it. But uh, I was looking at this. So basically this was only released in only 300 theaters in the U S because mm-hmm. it made a ton of money overseas and Miramax did not, did not want to give this movie any more marketing here in the U S because like, well, we made our money. We're out. <laughs> we're out of here. So I think again, we're talking about it, but it's not a very talked about movie. It's a very much an underground cult movie. Yeah. Um, I think the only reason it's still sticking around today is that Christian Bale's the lead in the movie. I could, I could get behind that. Because some of the other casting that Bale was always the guy that they wanted, but if they couldn't get Bale, uh, Dominic Purcell, who is in this movie, uh, was set to play the, the main character. So if you had Dominic Purcell and Tay Diggs on this poster of Equilibrium, we would not be talking about it today. No, we wouldn't know about this movie. But it, it is kind of funny seeing Dominic Purcell in this movie at the very beginning, though, and to think that he could have been the lead. Yeah. Um, yeah, Equilibrium, 2002. I think uh, I would be all right with a, a sequel, too. Yeah. If you could I get... Can- if you could get Bale to, to sign on for a sequel, maybe get let, let Kurt Wimmer do a round of the screenplay and produce the movie. I would be all right with, but give it to another director and give him a, a writing partner. Right. Give him Goyer. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> two, two minds, uh, very similar styles in the way they create ideas, but they need someone to rein them in. Right. So not Tarantino either. Uh, I mean, that would be that would be fun. Yeah, but he sometimes needs somebody to help rein him in, too. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. That is very true. This is very true. All right. So should we wrap up our fi- we, final thoughts on Equilibrium, then? We, we definitely should. Uh, once again, it's on Netflix right now if you want to check it out. If you're into, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, that early 2000s style action movies, dystopian oh, movies. It, this is it definitely movie. is that. Yeah, so let's let's round off our discussion here with some of the other things we got going on with uh, Backlot 605. Yes. We should talk about, we're going to give some other new technologies a test. We're going to give it a go here. Um, April 19th, uh, we are going to be doing a Netflix watch party. So we're going to join the kids, join them on the Netflixes. And <laughs> we're gonna... Join them on the Netflixes. On the Netflixes, and we're going to watch the cult classic, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. So grab your cotton candy, grab your popcorn, grab your your crazy balloon animals, and let's watch Killer Clowns from Outer Space together. That'll be fun. It'll be fun. be fun. April 19th, Netflix Watch Party. Uh, for more information, go to our Facebook page. We have posted an event link to that, and you can find, uh, fi- find out how to use Netflix Watch Party. And uh, going forward, we'll make a, a Facebook post that evening as well as to how to join uh, said party. Yes. Um, April 30th, we're going to we're gonna give Zoom, we're going to test the, the limits this of Zoom. This right here. This right here. We're going to test it out. Uh, we're going to try our South Dakota film community group. I mean, we've missed a month, and we're, we're all itching to get together and talk some movies together because it's going to – we're all hunkered down, but we're still itching to, to meet up and talk about movies. So we're going to do, do it through technology this time. Using Zoom. So using Zoom, April 30th. That is a Thursday evening. Uh, I believe we're going to start at 7 p.m. this time mm-hmm. so we can all get to bed on time. But, uh, yeah, that being said, uh, April 30th, 7 o'clock on Zoom. Again, there is an event link on our Facebook page uh, to this to figure out how to join. Again, I will post a link to the Zoom meeting as soon as we are up and running that evening. So look for that all on our uh, Facebook event page. Yes. All right. You can find Backlot 605 and all of our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply Backlot 605. And you can follow us on Backlot605.com for our latest movie news, reviews, articles, and discussions. Yes, yes, you can. Brian, I'm going to throw it off to you. Plug where the people can find you. And like we did last week, 
give us a recommendation for a movie that you have uh, either watch, watched recently or that you know is streaming somewhere. Mm, well, you can definitely follow me on uh, Instagram under LP Freak. Uh, on Letterboxd as well, you can find me there. Um, I would actually say, and I actually just realized that I've been telling people LP Freak for uh, Letterboxd and it's LP Freak forever, but hey, you, you still would have found It'll me. It'll still pop up. You'd still find me. Um, I've actually started working on getting through my Bond films, and I did just recently get watched uh, Goldfinger, so I would definitely recommend watching uh, the Bond films just in general. Uh, you can forget about the first two. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. We talked about uh, it last week. I, we did. But yes, those are... Look, I, I actually I own the Bond films and whatnot, but you can actually find them on Amazon uh, Prime under not only in HD but in 4K. So I thought, hey, I've only got them on Blu-ray, and if I can watch them in 4K and if I can get anything to look even prettier, man, that's what I'm doing. And so far, um, gotten through Golden Eye or Golden Eye, Goldfinger, and uh, Thunderball, and they they look beautiful for for considering the fact that these movies are, you know. How many years old? So yeah. Bond. Bond. Bond on Amazon Prime. Bond. Uh, for me, we'll, you... we'll forget about the Mortal Kombat that I was watching. <laughs> Which are, uh, the first one is on Netflix, right? First one's on Netflix, yes. First one's fun. First one's fun. Second one's horrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you can follow me online on Instagram, Casey underscore the horror guy. I'm reviewing every single horror movie that I watch. So check out any of my recent uh, horror watches there. But uh, my pick and recommendation for the week is not a horror movie, but is because of a horror movie that I'm watching this. So right now, Shudder is streaming the Cursed Films documentary series. Oh, yes. And one of the episodes, um, I believe it was the Omen episode, mentioned City Slickers. And they were showing scenes from that. And I'm like, God, I haven't seen City Slickers forever. So I, it is available right now on Vudu for free with ads. Uh, which there isn't a whole lot of ads you can sit through them. Um, but yeah, City Slickers right now on Voodoo. I miss comedies like that. Those are f just fun, wholesome comedies that really have a lot of emotion to them too. There's a lot, it, they, unlike a lot of, I think a lot of comedies fall into this where they're just kind of slapped together. Who can we get in this movie really quickly? Right. But this is actually a, a cinematic movie. They're herding cattle. They're trying to get cows out of the freaking river. Like they're they got dealing Jack with Palance. They have freaking Jack Palance, who's great in the movie. Um, yeah, I, I highly recommend watching City Slickers if you have not, or if you want to revisit it because you haven't watched it in a while. But mm -hmm. yeah, City Slickers right now on Voodoo. Voodoo. First uh, big screen appearance of Jake Gyllenhaal as well. Yeah, I know. You sent me those screenshots, and I was like, it, it, he was so young enough that I was like, I recognized the face, but I had to look it up to be like, who is this kid? Oh, my goodness. That's Jake Gyllenhaal. Jakey G plays Billy Crystal's son in the movie, and Daniel yeah. Harris is a, a class member of his in the movie for like one line. Right. Which is fun. So, yeah, go check out City Slickers. Do it. It's great good. You know, it's, it's definitely good classic Billy Crystal. Oh, yeah. All right. So thank you all for listening to the show. Please uh, give watching. us a what? And watching. And watching. We're we're trying to trying to do the Zoom video thing. Hopefully it's working for us here. Uh, if not, then you're going to be staring at a, a single image of of Tay Diggs smiling or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, for next week's episode, we're going to leave a poll on our Facebook page. So go. Uh, vote on our poll for what uh, topic you want us to talk about next week. So that'll be up there uh, and you can vote for that and give us an idea of what what we should do for next week's episode. But uh, I'll give a little tease for what we have coming up after that. We're going to be revisiting a topic we were set to do a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be doing a little mini series in May. Cause we thought, why not? We, why you not? Know, why not? So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. We'll talk about uh, those more as we get closer to those episodes. But uh, anyway, this has been the Backlot 605 Podcast. Brian, do you have yes. any final thoughts? Be safe. Wash your hands. Don't go out if you don't need to. Yes, and stay home, watch movies, and until next time.
For Brian Mensing, I'm Casey Kelderman, and we'll see you on the back lot of South Dakota.